All right, some of you have broken the rules, but I'm glad you're connecting to some good people. What a great morning. Man, aren't you glad you're in church today? This is a good day to be here. I uh, want to start a series talking about rest for your soul. And I think people uh, look good on the outside a lot of times, but are stressed out on the inside. And sometimes our souls are weary and frayed and emotional, you know, carrying things, and it's difficult. But I love that Jesus cares about what's going on on the inside of our hearts and our, and our lives. And since I'm doing Rest for the Souls, I thought this would be a perfect series for me to actually sit down for this message instead of stand up to preach. So y'all good with that? I'm going to just enjoy, and I'm going to rest, and I'm, but I'm going to still preach good. I might have to stand some point, but I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you from this uh, angle right here. Is that cool? Y'all good with that? You're sitting down. You know, the rabbis used to sit down, and the people would stand for the sermon. Aren't you glad you, you don't go to that church? All right. So th- at least it's even today. Here's the verse I want to start with, and I want you to imagine Jesus is uh, saying these words with a lot of love and a lot of compassion to people just like us that are worn out, frazzled, and frayed. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now, how many of you have ever gone to somebody that you wanted to trust, but they weren't humble, or they weren't gentle, they couldn't teach you anything? And it's just like, it was frustrating because you opened up. You know, I'm telling you, Jesus, if you will go to Jesus, he'll teach you. He's humble, and he's gentle at heart. And, and what he gives us in trade for what we're carrying is great. And he, I'm telling you, he does a great trade. And we're going to talk about this and how we find rest for our souls. And it's going to be wonderful. I, I got to tell you, I got to start with a story today uh, because I feel like my life is sometimes fast paced, at least for, for me it is. Got a lot going on, got, you know, <clears throat> uh, kids and life and work and ideas in the yard and I don't want to just do everything and there's shows I want to catch up on. Anybody relate to that? You just feel like it's a blur. So I had a great opportunity. My pastor, Pastor Bob McGregor, once a year gathers his uh, church planners, the, the, the teams that he sent out and has us come back for a, 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 a conference or a weekend and it's a great time of getting poured into. And one of the guys took over a church in Hawaii so we're like, Pastor, let's go to that guy's church, you know, the next time. Best decision we made. So we went in February and had our annual retreat in Hawaii. God is good. And so we go there. But getting there was difficult because the day that we were scheduled to fly out was the exact day that the snow blizzard starts coming down in Tri-Cities. Y'all remember that, right? And so uh, we were supposed to leave at like 11 a.m. in the morning. And I wake up, and there was a prediction of snow. But I'm like, yeah. You know, and all of a sudden it starts to snow and I get an alert on my phone. Your flight's been bumped to one o'clock, almost immediately bumped to 145. And I'm like, oh man, I live up on a hill and I tend to get a little bit more snow than on the lower uh, places. So I called Brie Walleen, who was going to drive us that day to the airport. I said, why don't you come and pick Lisa and I up, get us to the airport, just in case I'd rather wait there than at our house and get trapped in the snow if it really gets bad. She comes and gets us to the airport at noon. The flight gets delayed to three o'clock. Now, we're supposed to go to um, Seattle, and then from Seattle to Hawaii. Our flight was supposed to leave Seattle at like 7 o'clock. Then they start showing on the news inside the Tri-City massive airport on the big, huge screens. They start saying all these stories about all the flights in Seattle are canceled. And I start freaking out. I'm like, not today, Satan. I'm getting to Hawaii. And I'm like, you know. So, so we're in the airport. They don't even give us the time now. They're just like, we're going to try to get you on a plane. We've got to de-ice it and all this. So they get us on a plane. We, we have to sit on the plane for like an hour before they leave. And I'm just like, I'm getting anxious, you know, and rightfully so. And I feel like righteous anger almost is starting to burn. We get to Seattle and we land, but we can't get to gate B12 because... They're trying to clear the ice, and they're trying to move planes. And, and so we're waiting. We could see the gate, 
and it's it's like 6:30 now, and I'm like, now it's 6:35. Uh, so I, I grab the um, the the airline waitress. What do they call those? Flight attendants. Well, they bring me food, so I just thought, you know. So I said, hey, can can I get can you can my wife and I get to the front of the plane? Our our flight leaves in 25 minutes, and uh, she said, oh yeah. So we stood at the front, took five more minutes checking the gate. We're getting off at B12. Got to get on at B14. So I'm like, I just got to get there, you know, get off the plane and they uh, make an announcement. All those heading from Seattle to Hawaii, your, your uh, gate has changed to gate C349 or something way <laughs> down there. So I asked the lady, I said, where is that? She goes, oh, it's about a mile. It's kind of a long walk. And I'm like, so I said, babe, I mean, I'm in panic mode now. I said, babe, I'm going to run. And she kind of looks at me, and I said, seriously, I'm going to run. Now, in the olden days, people used to dress up to go on a flight. Not me, man. I'm in flip-flops, walking shorts, got my backpack on. I'm in comfort mode. And so I'm like, I'm going to run. And, uh, babe, you just catch up. I will physically hold the doors open. We're going to Hawaii. I start running. I probably kicked over a couple seeing eye dogs, small children, a lot of different things. But I'm like, I've got to get there. So I'm racing. And I get to the gate finally. And I'm like, I got like six minutes before the flight's supposed to leave. Kept swiping my phone to update, see if, it had, if they had delayed it. And at this point, I come into this new little alcove that they built. And it's this all glass window thing. It's kind of nice. But there's a cement ramp that goes down, makes a turn, and then goes down again. So like a champ, like a beast, I run down the thing, make the turn, and I start going down, and I'm going full speed, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm sucking air out, like, like the plants are going like this as I'm breathing. <laughs> and this, they, they tricked me. It was smooth going down, but on the second part going down, the ramp went like this, and it has a flat spot, and then went down again. I didn't see that. I hit that, and it was enough to throw me off, and I, this is not a lie. I Superman down the, the thing on my knees bloody knees 30 yards I slid down the whole thing people are racing over some guys like are you okay and I'm like I kind of knocked the one out of me I said did I catch my flight you know like I and I'm and I had hit my jaw and I get up and I'm like leave me alone I don't need an IV like I get I, I get to the counter this is I get to the counter I said okay I said we're here the molds I said and the lady goes, oh, it's going to be a while. <laughs> so now I, I need a doctor and a therapist. And I'm, I, Lisa comes walking in. And, and I, said, I said, we're going to wait. It's, they, they don't, they're not even posting the time. But so far, it's still supposed to leave. They get on. They go, all right, everybody who's going from Seattle to... Uh, Hawaii, you are going to make your flight. It's leaving at 9.30 or whatever at gate B15. <laughs> Down the road, I'm going to do a series on cussing, but that's not today's message. But uh, I'm gonna, I've walked through some things. All right. So, <laughs> so I, I feel like that trip at the airport it's not that uncommon in my life. Like, like, it feels like that's the speed of my life sometimes. And just going, 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 going. And I want to take a few of these messages and talk about how do we find rest for our souls. And it's going to be really good. But I, I want to talk today specifically about one thing. I want to talk about one of the things that's killing us on the inside is the speed of life. And I think we need to slow down in certain areas and allow the God of the universe that created this thing to reveal himself and pour into us and not just be like, God, I texted you. Why are you not texting back? Like, in, you know, I think we need to slow down a little bit. So I want to address that. I, uh, my pastor's wife, uh, our pastor is Bob and Sue McGregor in Vancouver. Uh, this is how old I am. I had a, a, one of my first cell phones. I got charged when people texted me. Anybody remember that, those days? And I was like, stop texting me, call me. And uh, my pastor's wife, just learning how to text, she goes, I had a very bad experience. I said, what happened? She goes, well, I was texting. 
And I said, well, what did you do, Pastor Sue? She said, well, some friends of ours, I found out that uh, one of their family members died. So I thought it would be nice and send them a note. And I just said, praying, LOL. And I said, Pastor Sue. I said, do you know what that means? She goes, yes, lots of love. And I said, no, it means laugh out loud. And she goes, I should text them back, you know. And I'm like, wow. And, and our culture has gotten to where we don't have time to get together, so now we call everybody. We don't have time to call people, so now we text people. We don't have time to text full words, so we LOL it. And sometimes we don't have time to actually type three letters, and so we pick an emoji. And listen to some of you, some of those emojis are inappropriate, and you know that. And I'm just saying, like, our culture has, like, gotten fast in communication. Uh, phone companies are pre-selling something that doesn't exist yet. They're advertising 5G uh, network. It doesn't exist yet. And, they're, and people are like, oh, I want to buy this new phone because it's going to be 5G. They're barely test marketing it in two single locations in Chicago with a 300-foot uh, radius around those two locations. Like, it's not a real thing yet, but they're trying to sell us because our life isn't fast enough. And so they're banking on that. I, um, I'm kind of a, a little bit of a time freak, and I, I, I'm obsessive on certain things, and I want to get a lot done. I enjoy working hard. I enjoy working long. I enjoy being creative and getting it. Like, I, I like to do that. Anybody else kind of, like, feed the, you feed the fire a little bit? And, um, but because I'm obsessive, compulsive a little bit, when we went to Disneyland on spring break with Abby for her spring break, we decided to get in line for um, Radiator Springs so we could see Toe Mater, right? This is a screenshot because they say it's going to be a long wait, and so I'm like, I'm going to time it. Like, this is weird. I shouldn't have done this, but that's actually how long it took me. Two hours, 29 minutes, 10.72 seconds. And that's a good thing because they said it was going to be two hours and 30 minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm counting it down so that I can be angry if I don't make it. Like, it's just weird, but that's me. But this is how our culture is built around time and speed. But it's not just now. In 1726, the book Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travels came out, where Gulliver is a human being. He lands on this island with the Lilliputians, I think, the little tiny people. And they tie him down. And they, they actually make this observation because they don't understand him. He keeps looking at this item. It happens to be his, his, his clock, his watch. And they say, that must be his God. And I think if aliens were to land on the planet and walk in here and they would see us in church in the rest of our life, they would go, your smartphones, that must be their God. They would not understand it. We're so tied to the drip of data and snippets and responses uh, and notifications that we can't do anything else. I um, read a book that I'm going to quote a couple things from today called In Praise of Slowness. And it was written in 2005. Not a Christian author, but the guy's got some great insight. And he talks about fighting against the culture of speed. And he says, this is how our brains work right now. He says, we're like a bee in a flower bed. The human brain naturally flits from one thought to the next. I don't know about you, but I've had a hard time at times slowing my thoughts down. In the high-pressure workplace where data and deadlines come thick and fast, we are all under pressure to think quickly. Reaction rather than reflection are, are the order of the day. To make the most of our time and to avoid boredom, we fill up every spare moment with mental stimulation. When was the last time you just sat in a chair, closed your eyes, and relaxed? We take our phones to the bathroom with us. You get in line at Walmart to check out. One person ahead of you and you open your phone. Like, it's just we can't do nothing very well. Am I talking to anybody for real in here today? I know I'm talking to me. We take caffeine in the morning to get us woken up, and we take melatonin or drink a glass of wine or something to go to sleep at night so that we can maximize and stay up as late as we want, catch up on Netflix, burn the candle at both ends the next day. That's our life. And it's like, man, maybe there's something to the idea about slowing down to help bring some healing to our souls. I want to give you a phrase that I want you to take home with you today or at least ponder and it's going to be on the screen for you. It's this. We are weary from what we carry and how relentless we run. And Jesus offers us a trade of lightness and restfulness.
Come to me, all of you who are carrying heavy loads. I love that about Jesus. Our souls, I think, are dying to slow down. Gandhi said, there is more to life than increasing its speed. And I think he's onto something there. In the, in the book, Praise of Slowness, Carl talks about the inside of a human, and he says the spirit, by its very nature, is slow. No matter how hard you try, you cannot accelerate enlightenment. Every religion teaches the need to slow down in order to connect with the self, with others, and with the higher force. In Psalms 46, the Bible says, Be still then and know that I am God. You know what I believe why some people cannot connect to God and don't believe in him? It's because we want an instant response to our silly questions or our deep, full, painful questions. And God doesn't tend to text back. He tends to slowly reveal himself. He doesn't have a smartphone. He's the creator of the universe. And I think he deserves a little more time from us and an approach that would say, show yourself to me. I'll give you as much time as you need because you invented time and I'm a speck on this planet. I think if we approached God with a little more reason in that way, we might get farther along. In his book, and I've got a picture of it, and some of you might want to get, get this book if you're a book reader. He writes as a cultural observer from the United Kingdom. He has great insights about things. He says that not everything should go slow. There's a need for, like, airplanes are a great invention, and of course, things like that. But he says there's certain things in life that should go slow and more enjoyment and richness comes from things if they're done slowly. I'm going to read some things. I want you to say amen back to these things because I want you to help me out here, all right? He says, uh, uh, he says it should, we should advocate for slower eating. Yeah, yeah, you're doing good. You're a little slow on the response. Be quicker <laughs> on the response in the slow message. He says we should have slower and longer conversations go on slow, longer walks. He advocates for this idea of slow cities and slow sex. And all the married people said, amen. Come on, somebody. I, got, I at least got your attention now. And he says, slow vacations. People are like, Amazon orders going through the roof right now. Can I tell you that there's some things that God intended to be slow, to be restful and, and rejuvenating? We've made everything in this world fast. And I, I think that we need to slow down. I want to give you my favorite quote of this message, I think. Are you ready? Here, here it is. I don't want to hustle. I'm going to show you who said it. Your soul. There are moments when your soul needs a break. It needs to slow down. Lily Tomlin, some of you have no idea who she is. It doesn't matter. She said, for fast acting relief from stress, try slowing down. It's amazing how it works. I, I want to give you a description of fast versus slow. I'm just kind of putting the pedal to the metal on this for a little bit. You okay with me? Because I want us, I'm hoping there's enough pain in what I'm talking about that not to expose you or, or me or make us feel like uncomfortable, except that I do want us to be uncomfortable enough to go, maybe I should address this area of my life. All right, you all with me? You okay? You're good? So here's fast and slow, and I want you to not think of it as, as, as the word fast, like actual speed, but I want you to think, does this describe your life as I give these descriptors? So fast would be this, busy, controlling, aggressive, hurried, analytical, stressed, superficial, impatient, active, quantity over quality. And I got to be honest, that's me a lot. And then here's the description of slow, calm. I'm going to read these slow because I feel like I need to honor this. <laughs> Calm, careful, receptive, still, intuitive and unhurried, patient, reflective, quality over quantity. I just think that, like, we're even talking about, like, I thought I'm going to sit down on this sermon Next week, worship's going to shift just a little bit for a week or two. I just thought, I want people to come to church the next couple of weeks not stressed out. Maybe you're stressed getting here, but maybe you leave going, God, that was, that was a drink of water. 
for my soul. And I want it to be a light of how every day should be for us when you connect with Jesus. Because I think our souls need some slowness. It's taking a toll on us. Uh, Judas Smith wrote a book. He's a pastor in Seattle and L.A. And he wrote a book, and the title is, is intriguing. It's called, How's Your Soul? And I think that's a great question. In the beginning of the book, he says, we started, uh, me and my friends, instead of trying to have this really shallow conversation, like, what's up? And how you doing? To go on, how's your soul? Because it forces a, a reflection and a, a like, man, that's kind of invasive. Like, how am I doing on the inside? You can't just be like, high five, I'm good. Like, there's some honesty that's got to happen at that moment. How's my soul? How are you doing? How are you caring for your soul? And I just think that there's some richness and depth. And by the way, that's where small groups shine because in a small group, you can begin to go, man, my soul's not doing so well. What? And we can help one another. But man, how's your soul? And in this book, he gives four things that the Bible instructs categorically to help bring rest to our soul. And it's not on the screen, but some of you like notes or you might remember these. These are the four things that he says. He says the four things the Bible instructs are for our soul is rest, and then it's responsibility, restraint, and relationships. Those are the things our souls need. Rest responsibility, restraint, and relationship. And he says this, he says, why is rest first? Rest is first because God is first. A restless soul is a soul that thinks it is in control and it needs to take care of everything. If we do not rest, we are trying to be our own God. Listen, let me just say it like this because I was literally burdened for you this week. And like, I just felt God's heart just... I know some of you are carrying the weight of the world. And some of you have just done some things in life and added things to your plate that it's just your soul is so frayed and tired. And I just felt God's burden. And I I know that God wants to bring healing even today. Like we're not going to leave you with just all the problems of this. I want to get you to Jesus today and let him touch your soul. But man, I... I think this, that when you take a Sabbath, when you take a rest, when you feast with family and you enjoy the beauty of God's creation and you pull apart from the work in the regular world, it's not just good for you. You're honoring God by saying, God, work will always be there, but I'm going to trust you to take care of the details. I'm going to give this time to you. You honor God in your life. By taking Sabbath rest. Next week, I'm going to talk about Sabbath. And it's, man, you're going to, it's so good. I, I, if you came today, don't, don't come today. Come next week. If you're already here, bring somebody. It's going to be amazing. In the book, Carl uh, Honore says that we've become uh, vo- velocitized. He says that we get used to the speed of our life. So think about this. When you first started to drive, the first time you got up to the freeway speeds and you got to like 60 or 65 or 70, it was thrilling. And you thought you were going to die and, or kill somebody else, right? And it was awesome. But then once you've done that, two weeks later, 70 doesn't have a thrill. Now 80 does. Then 80 is not a thrill. Now 90 is. And this has become how we do our life. Like we don't have a measuring rod to know are we slowing down enough very well. What we have a measuring rod for in our life is go, my life feels like it's at 90 right now and I'm used to 80. But we continue to incrementally increase. We get velocitized and used to the speed of the pain and the pressures of life that we're in now. And we don't slow down. We add to it. Are you with me on this? I want to I want to show you that this is like your life. I've got this real backpacker's heavy backpack. Sorry if I flash. A little bit right down there. So, all right. What happens in our life is we start off maybe with a fanny pack, but we upgrade, right? And we get to this, and we're we're constantly adding things, and we just fill it up with. Experiences. Was that me? Did I do that? I am needing to slow down my heart rate right now. Thank you, Jeff. Can we just give Jeff a round of applause? 
And, and honestly, I'm not that good of a person. I'm just glad that's not my iPad. So I'm sorry to my friends. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, but what does happen is you, our life, we continue to add things. And some are good things and some are bad, but it doesn't matter. The weight of life becomes what we carry. And then you add some tragedy into your life or a loss and all of a sudden this thing. And, and, and if you could see yourself in the invisible spiritual way that God would see you, you would look like this from the weight of what you're carrying and you can't walk normal and your life is getting distracted. And so what you do is you rob from tomorrow into today to bring a little relief and you try to, and it adds, and you just, the weight increases. And Jesus says, come to me, all of you who carry heavy weights and are burdened by life. And I'll give you rest. And I'll give you something different to carry. My yoke is easy. The burden I'm going to give you, it's light. And I'm telling you that you're going to carry something in life. But God wants to give you lightness and rest. And man, I I just want this to ring in your mind as a picture of maybe what God wants to even do today. Like I'm just, I feel it spiritually for some of you. And I know some of you are feeling it spiritually right now too. And what happens is if the pastor or somebody says, man, make some margin in your life to go to church more or pray more, we go, I don't, I can't even do what I'm doing. How do I do this? But maybe we should unpack a little so we can do what heals our souls, find some rest for our souls. Man, in our culture, people are struggling with uh, how to do life, and uh, it's causing mental illness and anxiety and stress and all kinds of things like that. And I've been kind of aware of this, work, really working on some of this message stuff since last December, working on it for myself and working on it for you. And so I was very hypersensitive to anything come across my newsfeed or Instagram that would talk about this. Carl Lentz at the beginning of the year had a big post, and he said that he took the first couple days of the year to just do nothing but rest. He said, I I canceled out everything but faith and family. He goes, and my soul benefited. I thought, what an interesting quote. And then you have people who are famous. uh, Paris Jackson, Michael Jackson's daughter, seeking treatment for emotional health. Taylor Swift, dealing with uh, being in an extremely low pace. And instead of doing an album every two years, it's the first time she went three years because she was in such a dark place personally. Sarah Hyland from Modern Family talks about contemplating suicide. Kendall Jenner said this, I have such debilitating anxiety because of everything going on that I literally wake up in the middle of the night with full-on panic attacks. Listen, waking up in the middle of rest with overwhelming anti-rest. That's our world and where some of us live. And then Adele said, I can slip in and out of depression quite easily, even when she's setting fire to the rain. Uh, She said, I had really bad postpartum depression after I had my son, and it frightened me. And some of you ladies have experienced that. Listen, I'm telling you that the weight of the world can crush our soul. And you don't have to be famous to do that. I'm just telling you that you're not alone in what you're experiencing on the inside. And even Jesus hit the wall internally when he's about ready to go to the cross somebody caught him saying these words now my soul is deeply troubled should i pray father save me from this hour no this is the very reason i came so father bring glory to your name listen when jesus ministers to you and i to give rest to our souls it's not from a place of inexperience of the crushingness that can happen to us. He has been there. He's experienced that. Uh, Judas Smith, uh, one more quote from his book, he said, it's the paradox of leadership and influence. Just because you lead people and help people doesn't mean you are always going to be healthy on the inside. If anything, the pressure of public influence increases the unhealthy tendencies of our souls. If we aren't careful, it can make us defensive and isolated Instead of looking for help when we need it, we pretend to have it all together. 
We want to look good on our Instagram page. We want to be good in front of our friends, even if we're dying on the inside. And the more people we know or the more people we're trying to impress, it's like I, I don't know if I can really break down and actually try to get what I need. And it's an incredible thing. I want to say this again. We are weary from what we carry and how relentless we run. But Jesus offers us a trade of lightness and restfulness. Come on, that's sounding better and better all the time, isn't it? Jesus wants to help us. I really believe this. And I've, I've had to, I'm a, I try to be pretty transparent. I, this has been a weak area in my life. And, but I've found that carving out time to pray every day when I wanted to and when I didn't, God has kept my soul truly like an anchor. And I I don't know what I would do without Jesus in my life. I can think of some awful things that would be numbing and fun for a little while. But I want to be healthy. I, I imagine Jesus, when he says this next phrase I'm going to show you, I imagine him looking us in the eye with a big smile on his face through his beard, tears coming down his cheeks, and he has this intense compassion for us. And he's looking into our souls to bring help. And, and, and he, imagine him like that, and he says these words. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? And then he smiles and he gets a little closer and touches us. And he goes, is anything worth more than your soul? And he's like, man, do you you need to buy a second backpack? Is that going to make you happy? Is that next job or the better car, the newest phone, or watching one more new show now that your show ends tonight? Like, you know, like what, what he was trying to get to our soul and he wants to help. I want to give you one other picture of comparison, and then I'm going to end with a scripture. There's two stories I want to compare. One is in Greek mythology. It's uh, Sisyphus, and I think that's fun to say. Like, if I was in junior high still, I would make fun of my friends. I'd be like, you're Sisyphus, but uh, that's just me. So probably not right, but uh, the story in Greek mythology here is that Sisyphus was cursed, and his curse involved this. They said, you're going to be in this valley... And the way to break the curse is to roll this or lift this boulder and get it to the top of the mountain. And if he can get it to the top of the mountain, the curse will lift. And inevitably, every time that he would go to bring this rock, this boulder to the top of the mountain, before he could get to the top, he would lose strength and it would fall and roll all the way back down to the bottom. Or he would trip and it would fall. Or the wind would blow and the rock, and he could never get the rock to the top of the mountain. On and on. For generations into eternity, this was his curse. And it was this endless cycle of work, 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 but never win, win, win. Never getting to the end. And I just go, do you know what the bottom of the mountain is in our lives in this story? Mondays. And I want to compare this to a, an, Isra- a, an Israelite story. A part of history from the nation of Israel and the Hebrew culture, they... We're in a place where they were longing to get out of captivity. And the story goes that God moved on their behalf out of compassion for them and got them into the land that they called the promised land, but they called it the land of of rest. The promise was that they would find a place of rest. I want you to have this in mind in comparison to this story from Greek mythology, the story of rest. And here's a few of the lines from One of the writers in the Bible says it this way. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest. That time is today. Listen, if you weren't paying attention today, listen to this. That time is today. So there's a special rest still waiting for the People of God, for all who have entered into God's rest, have rested from their labors. They've taken off the backpack. 
just as God did after creating the world. Listen, you're going to be, you've got to compare these two stories because these two stories are, are two worldviews, two stories of life, two symbols of what it's like for you and I. We're either pushing a boulder up a mountain trying to break a curse and we just can't get there. Or we're going to submit and surrender to God and let him do the work for us and we're going to find rest for our souls. And these two stories are so powerful. Listen, your soul was made by God. It was designed to connect spirit to spirit with him. Augustine, he said it the best. He said, or Augustine, he said, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless. Or our soul, I could put in there, is restless until it finds its rest in you. Listen, you're going to wake up tomorrow. Monday's coming, whether you like it or not. And you got to decide if you're just going to push that mountain up again or that rock up again, or if you're going to get some rest for your souls. And you, you might go, well, I'm just going to take some, I'm going to unpack some things out of my backpack. That would be good. But your, your soul's not going to get healed unless you really just come into the presence of Jesus. Go, Jesus, I'm here. Would you just sit with me? Would you speak to me? I'm telling you that he's humble and he's gentle at heart. He's not rough. He's not going to demand something from you. And he wants to teach you. He'll give you some instructions about your life. He's good like that. And he says, in doing that, I'll give you rest for your soul. I just think that's so beautiful. Some of you need to marry Kondo your soul. Marie Kondo or Mary Kondo? Marie, yeah, it's Marie. Y'all watch this? Go watch it on Netflix. She talks about how to clean out your garage and your clean your life up, and it's called tidying up, and it's the hottest thing on Netflix. I know because I binge watch stuff. And uh, she says when you grab an item, you, you can tell if you should get rid of it or not. By when you hold it, does it spark joy? If not, get rid of it. Can I tell you that most of us just keep stuff in here even if it doesn't spark joy anymore? But Jesus is the source of joy, and we need to get rid of some stuff out of our soul and find the one who is the source of joy. So I'm learning, I'm learning how to do this in my life. So I'm almost done today, um, just so you know. I'm learning to slow down just a little bit. So last year, I worked six days a week uh, er, I worked every Saturday except for four Saturdays last year, 2018. And I realized that's not a healthy pattern. And I was getting pretty tired and it had a bad effect on me. But I just like getting stuff done and doing more. And I determined I wasn't going to do that this year. So far this year, I've only worked on two Saturdays, which is pretty good for me. And I'm just setting boundaries and making some tough decisions but I feel like my soul is benefiting from that. And uh, I want to keep my soul healthy because I want to stay around Jesus. I want to be around my family and I want to be around New Vintage Church for as long as possible. Uh, Lisa and I are going to do something really healthy for us as a couple in mid-July, excuse me, mid-June and all of July, we're going to take a sabbatical, six weeks off. And we're just going to not be around here. And we're going to go rest and, and see some family and friends. And um, this is not a reactionary thing to some, a, a something that happened. This is a prevention of a something <laughs> in our lives. And it wasn't planned because I'm a little worn out right now or anything like that. We started talking about this with our elders uh, 16 months ago, January of 2018. And said we need to look at just getting a break for us. And so we're going to do that. And I got a great team here. Church is going to happen. My prayer is that is two things. One, don't call me. Number two is that uh, that church attendance goes up, church giving goes up, salvations go up, baptisms go up, serving, getting on a dream team goes up while I'm gone. That's what I want to come back to. Uh, I want to do that. I want to read you these last uh, one scripture. It's the one we start with. And I'm going to be done. But uh, hold on, just a minute. Go back on the screen for a second. Just for a second. I want you to imagine something with me tonight, today. 
I want you to, I'm gonna have you close your eyes. I'm gonna do a little exercise with me. And I want you to imagine that you're there when Jesus is saying these words. You're worn out, you're tired, you're trying to get home, you're trying to get everything done. And somehow in the crowd of people where Jesus is at, you're not in the back or in the middle of the crowd, you're right in the front. And so as Jesus is saying these things to maybe thousands of people, he is actually making eye contact with you and seeing you and looking into your soul as he's saying these words. And so keep your eyes closed and I'm gonna read this to you and I want you to see Jesus' face as best you can in your mind. Come to me, all of you who are weary and you carry heavy burdens. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you, it's light. Don't you just love Jesus? Would you keep your eyes closed? I wanna pray with you. Father, I'm praying that there would be a, a presence of the Holy Spirit here at this moment to heal people who are just feel so frazzled and so worn out, like their soul has been darkened and even numb. And I pray that your spirit would just bring light to it. Pray that you would just let us sense the touch of the creator's hand on our life and that there would be a sense of hope and a sense of healing and no guilt for how we've run, just a fresh start today and like wind in our sails. And I thank you that your promise was to bring rest for our souls. We receive that today. We want that from I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes closed, but let me just talk for the last 30 seconds. If you came to church and you're just really far, far away from God and you don't have any kind of relationship with Jesus, you never have, you, but somehow life circumstances or whatever, you just got yourself into church or you decided, man, I need to make Jesus number one in my life. I need God. He, he will respond to that kind of faith that you have. And you can start your relationship with him right now. Today, you can enter into his rest. Like, you respond by praying a prayer of faith. God sees where you're at. And I would love to pray for you right where you're at. And everybody's eyes are closed. When you go, Pastor, I need to start a relationship with Jesus in my life. I want you to pray for me. I want you to stick your hand straight up in the air right now. Come on, it's wonderful. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thanking you because I'm so glad for you, and I think Jesus is so glad that you're giving up on your on your old ways and go, I'm gonna, I need you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. The whole church is gonna say a prayer together. I want everybody to pray it out loud, everybody. But if you raise your hand, this is gonna have special meaning to you. I want everybody to pray this. Uh, as loud as you talk to your neighbor on a normal day. Ready? Jesus, I come to you in faith. And I surrender myself to you. I ask you to forgive me of everything wrong I've done. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead my life. I commit to following you today. I'm going to do it your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.